Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Today on Another View, we're talking about etiquette, particularly dining etiquette. During this holiday season, many of you will attend dinner parties, and you want to be sure you are on your P's and Q's at the table. Or perhaps you are giving a holiday party. Do you know the proper way to set your table? What are the dining do's and don'ts? Authors Rosemarie Burns and Linda Reed are here with us. They wrote a book called Which Fork Do I Use? And we have advice right here on Another View. But first, this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. I hope you had a fabulous Thanksgiving vacation, and I thank you for joining us this afternoon. A program note before we talk about dining etiquette today. Please make an appointment to tune in Monday night at 9 on our sister station, WHRO-TV, for part one of WHRO's Veterans Voices Town Hall. Our very own Lisa Godley is hosting this important conversation that delves into the challenges that so many veterans face. Challenges like getting their VA benefits and military downsizing. That's on this coming Monday, December the 7th on WHRO TV 15 at 9 p.m. And a reminder, if you need to sign up for health care insurance, December 15th is the last day to enroll or change your plan. If you want to see new coverage, if you want your new coverage to begin on January 1st, 2016. Celebrate Healthcare has a series of upcoming workshops to help you enroll. Call 757-287-0277 or visit CelebrateHealthCare.net to find out more. Now, according to our guest today, the reality is the opinions of us are formed by the way in which we dine. From the interview luncheon to the black tie six course formal affair to a simple meal at home, proper etiquette, manners and the art of setting a proper table are important. But sadly, they're becoming a lost art. Arthur's Rosemary Burns and Linda Reed say, no worries. These are things that all of us can learn, and they are here to help us. They are the authors of Which Fork Do I Use? And joining us from Danville, California, is Rosemary Burns. Hi, Rosemary. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Great. And joining us from Eugene, Oregon, is Linda Reed. How are you, Linda? Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> Great. So I want to start by you all talk about how important the meal is in determining how people perceive us. So talk to me a little bit about that, Rosemary. Well, I think we're, we're judged by the way we eat and dine and dress and treat other people. It's so important because respect starts basically with dining, you know, when we're in, in a high chair. So it's very important that we teach our children manners and to respect each other at the dinner table. And we're judged favorably if we have good manners. If we don't have good manners, we're not invited back. And it's very easy to learn good manners. But if you're not taught them as a child, um, and depending on who you associate your life with, it, it matters. It makes a big difference in your life. And now the Fortune 500 clubs and you're finding more and more corporations taking you to lunch and dinner to make their choice of who they're going to hire today mm-hmm. based on their table manners. Because there's so many applicants and so many college graduates that they're taking them to lunch and dinner for that final interview. And so that is critical. Linda, you also talk about the fact that technology plays a role in why we are losing the art of proper dining. Well, part of what happens is that people are so consumed with their personal devices, whether it's their cell phone, their their iPads, and they forget. They'll go into a restaurant even talking on their cell phones and continue a conversation when a server will come to them. And again, Rosemary was alluding to the fact that respect happens at the dinner table, but that's respect for the people around you by ignoring them and continuing with your own conversation. So I think part of what happens is that people are so, uh, we have the instant gratification of connecting to people and seeing what's happening with our Twitter feed and, and checking our emails and texting friends and that sort of thing that they 
they feel as though they can transport that to the dinner table as well, and they're really not present with the people that they're at that they're dining with. Mm-hmm. So technology, while we all have it and we all enjoy it and it's very beneficial, it it disconnects us from the other people that we're around. So both of you were trained and certified by the Protocol School of Washington in Washington D.C. That, is that that's where um, people who work in the White House and other uh, places are trained in order to know how to set a table, how to act um, in a dinner situation and so forth. Talk to me a little bit about your training, either one of you. Well, we're certified in 10 different areas. That's where Linda okay. and I met each other. We were attending one of our certification courses, and Linda and I met at the Protocol School of Washington. It's a pretty extensive course, and it covers social etiquette along with dining etiquette and business etiquette and children's etiquette. So it was pretty extensive of treating others correctly and you know properly and and making us be aware of what Linda and I learned so much ourselves by attending. You just don't know what you don't know. And once you attend a course like that, and we've been teaching etiquette for over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And and, um, Linda, let me ask you, do you think that um, people think that this is kind of old fashioned now? This is, this is stuffy or that this is just becomes a part of life. Oh, I don't think that they think it's stuffy. Uh, I just did a six-day event up here um, uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday, and people were coming by my table, and so many of them don't know how to get started entertaining. And that's kind of the unfortunate part about it, and that's where the beauty of our book, Which Fork Do I Use, comes in, because they don't have to have a background in knowing what to do. We, The very beginning of the book, first of all, we give them definitions, and then we uh, give them a step-by-step way to serve a meal, and it, it we give them all kinds of options throughout the book. So they, I think that people are actually hungry for the knowledge, and they're hungry to want to know how to do it correctly. But some of them don't realize that it's all in their control, that they just have to take a first step and and invite people over and then just start on a slow, you know, a small a small basis. And, and certainly they can gain a lot of confidence by reading our book. Mm-hmm. And I did have a chance to read through your book, and you're absolutely right. We, I even found some things that I was surprised at. So let me first invite our audience to join our conversation, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join us. What are your etiquette questions? What are your questions about how to properly set a table? Give us a call and let's talk about it. 440-2665 or one 800 940 So when I was looking through your book, ladies, um, the first thing that jumped out at me, you said coffee and teacups are for breakfast, rarely at lunch and never for dinner. And I have been to I don't know how many hotel dinners and luncheons and they always have a coffee cup on the table. Why is that? <laughs> Well, I think that you you kind of have to separate home dining from um, feeding the mass quantities because they they're not going to have time to bring out an individual mm-hmm. cup and saucer for each. Say they had a group of fifty or a hundred people, just the the amount of staff time that it takes to deliver that cup and saucer on request just takes too long. So you're going to see things in a banquet situation that is done for the efficiency of having and providing food in maybe a two-hour period or one-hour period for a large group of people. So, um, And certainly in your home, uh, you can do whatever you want. You know, we're just giving you the guidelines. And, for example, you might have – I have at some of my dinner parties a a particular couple that I invite a lot, and they – um, they don't drink alcohol, and so they. I will serve them cup, uh, their cup of coffee or decaf, whatever it is that they want, or tea, separately, and bring that out. But if you're basically, if you're setting a table that's a, more of an upscale or, or a formal type dinner, then no, a cup and saucer doesn't go on the table. You bring it out when you have dessert. Okay. Uh, Rosemarie, let me ask you this. Um, A lot of times people go, and I watch them because I do attend a lot of these dinners, and everyone watches everyone else to figure out 
who's going to be the <laughs> first one to take the bread plate and they go from there. <laughs> so how do right. we know so which bread question, plate? <laughs> like what plate, is, you know, what yes. glass is mine? Yes. What, <laughs> what bread and butter plate is mine? Which one do I use? And so the first one takes it and makes a mistake and then everyone's in trouble. So if exactly. an easy rule is BMW, you know, bread, okay. meal, water. Liquids on the left, liquids on the right, and solids on the left. So remember um, BMW, because if one person, especially at a banquet where there's so many plates, say you have a table of ten, it's really hard to define what area is yours, what glass is yours, what napkin is yours. Especially if they put the napkin in the glass, which they, that can be very yes. confusing. So if you remember BMW, you know bread, meal, bread on the left, meal in the middle and water on the right. So the napkin then, if it's in the coffee cup, as it oftentimes is, or in the glass, it's to your right, correct? Well, the napkin should be on your plate or to the left, but often you'll see it on the right-hand side in the drinking water glass or uh-huh. your wine glass. So if you just sort of disregard the napkin, because the water glass on the right is yours what? always. So liquids on the right. If that napkin happens to be in that water glass, then you claim it, it is yours. Oh, okay. So you purchase our book, you can be the first one to start everyone off by taking, you know, taking a sip out of your water glass or putting your napkin on your table and your bread plate. The bread plate seems to be the most common mistake made because it's so close. And I was at a, a, a dinner, a woman's business meeting recently with some executive women, and uh, I was sitting at the table and they passed the bread and I said, no, thank you. But the person to my left put her bread on my bread plate. And I thought this is the perfect time without me saying, that's my plate. I said, I changed my mind. Can I have a piece of bread, please? And so they passed it back to me. And I took a piece of bread and I went to put it on my plate to the left. And she said, oh, no, I used the wrong plate. And then everyone laughed. And (laughs) I said, not a problem. We'll share it. And so Ah. I just sat mine there for a moment. But really, I could have put my my bread on my dinner plate. So if someone does mistakenly use your bread plate, then you can take your piece of bread and put it on your dinner plate and just not say a word. So just remember the liquids on the right and solids on the left and you'll be fine. Okay. So let's talk about setting a basic table. First of all, do you believe that every meal you should set the table? Uh, Let's take that uh, Linda. Well, I do. I, I, I mean, it's like, why wouldn't you? Uh, you're going to use a knife and a fork. Uh, you're going to use a plate or or a cereal bowl or whatever you're going to have. So it doesn't. I mean, there, I guess if you're sitting in your pajamas like we all do, <laughs> and and we want to eat that our bowl of cereal on our lap, we can do that. But if you're going to set at a table, you might as well set the table the correct way, and then you just get in the habit of. I I look at it as treating myself. And I just wouldn't think of doing it another way. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially if you have kids, I think that that, um, that formality and, and just the coming together and doing it in the right way so that they understand their conduct at a dinner table or a breakfast table, I think it's really important to start with the kids in a, in a young manner because they're so busy these days and everything, it's hard to, to get them all together for a dinner so when you do have dinner, I think it is important to set the table correctly and and, and all meet as a family and, and gather around that table. And if schedules are such that you can't do it on a weekly basis, you should at least strive to have one day a week where everybody has a family dinner together. Okay. So let's talk about a basic table setting then. Can you, um, Rosemarie, walk us through what should be on the table? Let's say for um, for dinner. For a family dinner. Well, depending on what you serve, because it all depends on what your menu is. Okay. So because you're going to work from the outside in. So if you're having a salad and you're serving it American style, then you would have your salad fork on the, if you're having a separate salad uh, course, you would have mm-hmm. your salad fork on the outside and then your dinner fork on the inside on the left-hand side. And you'd have your knife on the right-hand side, blade facing the, your plate. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're having soup, or something that you would use your spoon for, you would have your spoon to the right side of your knife. If you're not having soup, then you never place the teaspoon on the table. And that's one of the common mistakes. We all grew up with that. My mom also, you know, we had all the flatware on one side. So the knife, fork, and spoon all went on the left side. 
and we had the teaspoon there always at dinner, and we never used it, so that teaspoon would just get picked up and put back in the drawer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you just don't use the teaspoon unless there's a purpose for it. So you're setting the table according to your meal. Whatever you're going to eat, then you place that piece of flatware there in the order of use. Okay, and then your water glass uh, would go on uh, to the right on um, above the knife. Is that correct? Yes, it goes right above the knife. So your water glass goes right above your knife, and then you have your wine glasses. In our book, you know, our book is really easy format. I'm sure you agree. Mm-hmm. It's a really easy format to follow. It's a template. It's basically a cheat sheet. So you can turn your five-year-old or four-year-old, or granddaughter sets the table. You can turn it to page the beginning and um, the very basics where you have one fork and one knife. Exactly. And start off there in the plate. It's a real simple guide. It's a you fold it back, it's a coil bound and you fold it back and there's a you know, templates for setting the table and each template is defined with a text saying what it is and, and the purpose of it. And regardless of whether you are, are at a um a breakfast meal um, at home or if you're at a six course dinner where there are lots of forks and lots of knives and so forth. You always work from the outside in. Yes. The rules are always the same. That's what makes it simplified. Once you, once you learn the rule that you work from the outside in, then you're the first one to pick up your flatware because you know what you're, you know, you basically can tell what you're going to have to eat when walking in and looking at your place setting. If you see the spoon there, you know, you're going to have soup. Um, Mm. So basically it's always working from the outside in. Okay. And uh, Linda, let me ask you then, um, in terms of um, a formal dinner, someone just wrote us from Facebook. They want to know if there are any foods you should eat with your hands during a formal dinner. If there are any foods that you should eat with your hands? Mm Mm-hmm. Um... If it's a Most formal of the dinner. time, I can't think just right off the, the I can think of top one, of my Linda. head. Uh, I can't think of anything at a formal dinner that you would. If you, for example, um, it, one of the templates that we have in our book is a sophisticated affair where you start off with a um, shrimp cocktail that has tails on it. Mm-hmm. Now, that's something that you could pick up that, that shrimp and eat it in one or two bites, and you would pick that up with your, your fingers, as opposed to if you had served a seafood cocktail, which would be like lump crab and small shrimp in a seafood cocktail glass, which is sort of um, it's like a little mini super mini um, iced tea glass, and then you would eat that with a little seafood fork. So there probably are a few things that you could eat, you know, with your fingers, but most of the time you're not going, at a formal dinner, you're not going to find a finger food. But, Barbara, I'd like to go back for just a half Mm -hmm. a second. Um, When you were asking Rosemary, and she was talking about uh, what you do, how you set the table for dinner, and this comes up quite a bit where people will set... There, Rose mentioned if you were having salad with your dinner, and she gave you an example of if you had uh, salad first as a separate course, and then you went ahead and had your main course, and so you'd set that salad fork to the outside of the dinner dinner fork. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to have salad served on the same plate as you have your main course, let's just say you had a chicken breast and some uh, roasted potatoes and then a green salad, you would not set a separate salad fork Ah, because you're going to eat that whole meal with your dinner fork and use your knife to cut your meat. And and so that salad fork would be unnecessary because you only need one fork per course. You know, speaking along those lines, too, again, back to those um, larger banquet type dinners, sometimes you go there and the and the waitress or or, or server will say, um, hold on to your knife and fork. So because they did not give you separate knives and forks. So where do you place that knife and fork? I place it, Rosemary. I place my, it happens often. I, if you have a, an extra dinner plate, if, if they removed your salad plate, then you just place it on your dinner plate. If you do not, if they're t- removing your dinner plate to bring you in a separate course, I place it on my bread and butter plate. Okay. But it never goes on the table, correct? No, it never goes on the table again. Unless you don't have a bread and butter plate and you don't have a plate, then you have no choice. And at that point, I sort of t- put the tip of the knife across my fork or something. I never would lay the blade right on the table, but I would sort of cross it on the top of the 
fork or something uh, to get the blade off to keep the blade off the table. Okay, so uh, inviting the audience again to join us at four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. Call us and tell us what your biggest dinner faux pas has been and how did you correct it. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. I the uh, another thing I thought was very interesting. You said that it is in. Uh, improper to tap on the glass for quiet when you're trying to give a toast, for example. <laughs> yes, yes, no? <laughs> you see it all the time, you know, and I think a lot of us, you know, who have really nice crystal and they take their knife or something and bang really hard, we're afraid that it might get cracked or broken. But, you know, often you'll see just a, if you can just barely tap it, I think that's permissible um, to barely tap it. You want to try to get their attention somehow and just say, you know, I'd like to make a toast. And okay. get everyone's attention that way rather than clank, clank something against it if you can, because you might break the crystal. Okay. So um, another question from Facebook. Do I have to try something on my plate that doesn't look appealing? How do you handle that <laughs> if it's something you absolutely just don't eat or don't want to try? Uh, let's well, see. Linda. I would say that you should try it. You should try it if you can't possibly can unless you're uh. allergic to it or you know, it's going to make you sick. If it's just so appalling and you can't try it, then move it around and pretend like you tried it. <laughs> so don't let it just sit in one spot. Just move it around a little bit and they'll think that you tried it. Okay. Linda, I want to ask you about this too. I saw, and this was very surprising to me because I think I've done this wrong my whole life. It says if you are serving sorbet um, to between meals to cleanse the palate, that you don't eat all of the sorbet. That's correct. You just say eat two or three little bites to to refresh your mouth and refresh your palate, and then they remove the rest of it. So it's yeah, it's not designed as a in that case because you're having that after a fish course, right? And so yes, yeah. I suppose if you um, if you wanted to eat that entire sorbet, the etiquette police probably are not there at the time, so you'd probably be okay. <laughs> four four zero. It's easier said than done, especially if it's really good for me. Exactly, exactly. Four four zero. <laughs> so just leave a little tiny bit at the bottom. <laughs> four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. What is your etiquette question? Diane joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Diane. You're on the Hi, how are you today? Okay, how are you? Fine. Good. Um, I wanted to hear the comments about uh, people blowing on their food, you know, the hot soup or hot anything. I was always told that it was inappropriate, but I just see it a lot these days. Okay, let's let, um, Linda, you want to take that one? Well, um, it it really doesn't help a whole lot to blow on it. And realistically, if you take your, your soup spoon and you skim the top of the soup first and you always spoon away from yourself, and that's so that you can take the bottom part of that soup spoon and then run it across the back edge of the bowl and remove any drips. That way you don't wear any of them. But <laughs> Um, if you just skim the top of the, the soup, rather than coming from the bottom of the bowl where the soup is going to be the hottest, that you'll have a, a much cooler soup to, to eat, and then you don't have to do the blowing on the food. Okay, Diane, I hope that answers your question. Thanks for calling. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Carol joins us from Hampton. Hi, Carol. Hi. Um, I have one comment and a sort of question. Okay. Um, about olives, I I know at the formal part you might not have olives to eat, but maybe before, as in uh, just wandering around drinking something. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that if you put an olive in your mouth with your hand, then you're supposed to take the seed out the pit and put it in your hand. But if you use a fork to get it in your hand, then you take the pit and put it back on, using the fork, put it back on your fork. Is that right? Okay, Rosemarie, why don't you take that one? I'm a little confused. So, if, I, um, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... so that, that your caller is correct. So if, if you, she's saying that if you take the olive and put it in your mouth with your hand, is that right, Carol? Yes. Okay, then you put the olive pit it back into your hand. Yes. 
Okay. That's correct. I, I wasn't sure if it was in a drink or was in a, from a little platter. So Sorry, that, that's I, correct. <laughs> Thing, just having heard about soup is if there's a cream soup spoon, you scoop away from you. If it's the other kind of soup spoon, you go toward you. And that's no, you what always, I heard. you always go away from you, regardless of the type of soup. Okay, Carol, thanks so much for your call. We appreciate that. If you're just joining us, we're talking about etiquette, manners, and the proper way to set a table, skills that are just in time for the holiday season, with Rosemarie Burns and Linda Reed, authors of Which Fork Do I Use? Let's see, do we have another call? Diane joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Diane, you're on the air. Hi, thanks. Okay, this has been an issue in my family for years. Okay. Um, You're dining, this is dining at a restaurant. Is it proper for the server to remove the finished plate from a diner who's finished as people finish or to wait until everyone has finished and then remove the plate? It seems they usually do the former. And so what we'll do is we'll say, when they try to take it, we'll say, no, thank you, because we're waiting for the other people to finish eating before the plates are cleared. Some of us are a little slower eaters, and when the plate's cleared as earlier finishers finish, it kind of tells the other person who's still eating, you know, hurry up, the meal's over, you're taking too long. So is there an etiquette regarding that for restaurants? Yes, you are correct. All the plates are removed at the same time. Unless you have that person who's, you know, monopolizing the conversation and he hasn't started eating yet. So the most important rule is to keep up with pace, to look around so everyone's sort of, you know, at the same pace. The waiter should remove all the plates at the same time. Unless you have that person who's, as I said, just taking too long, then you would nod. You'd give him notice to go ahead and remove your and start removing plates so he would get the message that he needs to speed up a little bit because if he's just taking way too long, which we have some of those uh, guests ourselves that come in there, they're monopolized the conversation so they haven't started the meal and everyone's ready for the second course. But you are correct. They should be removed at the same time. Okay, Diane, thanks so much for the call. And Rosemary, while you're on that subject, please remind people that you are supposed to wait until everyone is served before you start eating, correct? Yes. <laughs> it's supposed to uh, and follow the lead of the host. We're talking about home entertaining. You follow the lead of the host, unless the host gives you permission to start. For example, if she's in the kitchen and she's still doing something and she's just served you soup, she might say, please start before it gets cold. Otherwise, you wait until she starts and everyone starts together. Okay. Another question we have from Facebook. Is it a right or wrong way to wipe your mouth? <laughs> Who wants that well, one? Well, technically, yes, because what you should do is you should lift that napkin from your lap and you should blot. Um, you see this more with men than you do with women where they will take that whole napkin and they literally wipe their mouth from one side to the other and it looks as though they're almost wiping their whole face. So really it's not, It's if you just remember that you're blotting, and not wiping, I think that it makes it visually, you, it's easier for you to remember how to do it. And so you just blot it periodically throughout the meal. Okay. Let's go. I might have oh, interject something um, mm-hmm. more on napkins is that it's not permissible to blow your nose in the napkin. <laughs> Yes, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> you see oh that so often. We have that question asked of us so often. Oh, gosh. Let's see. Yeah. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. What are your questions about how is the best way to entertain your guests? Or better still, call us to talk about ways that you can be a good guest guest 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 demetrius joins us from portsmouth hi demetrius you're on the air How you doing? How okay you doing? hi uh i was having that problem what is the how do you tell the difference between a salad fork and a regular fork okay uh let's see um linda you want to take that one I, I i missed the first fork it was the difference sal- difference between a salad fork and a regular fork or a dinner fork. Uh, well, the size. size will be, the size will tell you the difference. The the tines on the salad fork, overall, it's probably about an inch shorter than a dinner fork. So the tines are longer on a dinner fork than they are on a salad fork. Okay, so basically, Demetrius, salad fork is shorter than the dinner fork. Does that help you? 
Yes. Okay. Thanks so much for the call. We appreciate that. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. I have a question for you all. How do you get your guests to leave? <laughs> I mean, Stay after you start dinner, and is there a proper amount of time that they're supposed to stay following the dinner? And then if they're overstaying, they're welcome. How do you get them to go? Um, I was just talking about this last night, actually, at a dinner party that I attended. It's interesting because we say that you should leave in you know, approximately an hour um, after dinner, after dessert. You okay. should leave after dessert, you know, within the half hour or so. But that lingering guest stays and stays. And you can you don't want to start doing dishes or cleaning up. You can also you can offer them a bottle of water. If everyone's uh, gone, you've got that lingering guest. Then get them a bottle of water, a glass of water, and then hand it to them. Usually they'll get the if you have a bottle of water, you can hand that to them. <laughs> they'll get the hint that it's time to leave. You can always you know turn the lights on high a little bit higher and start picking up. You know, then once you start picking up, then he'll they'll realize it's time to go. Uh-huh. And you don't do that until the very last resort. But the right time to leave is kind of you know we were talking about this last night because you work so hard in putting this dinner party on. And then as soon as one person leaves, they all leave, basically, unless you have that lingering yeah. guest. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you don't want to just up and leave at a dinner party and be aware that if one person has to leave early and they say, I'm sorry, I've got another commitment or I've got a meeting tomorrow, I have to get going. That doesn't mean that everyone has to leave because the poor hostess has worked all day serving the meal and everyone feels that that's a hint to leave and it's, it's really not. I got you. That one individual has to leave early. And then along those same and, lines, what if you have a guest who um, either makes an offensive statement or has had too much to drink, is just not being a great guest? How do you handle that? Well, I think at that point you try to, you know, you try to change the subject and just, and you're just going to have to say something, you know, because that happens the first time you let it go. Second time you just say, you know, I think we better change the subject and move on to something, you know, a different topic okay. and try to do that the best that you can. Okay. And if someone has had too much to drink, um, Rosemary? Well, you want to call Uber or a cab or something. You don't want okay. them to drive home. That's the first rule. Okay. All and right. You just, you just give them a glass of water, you know, and just uh, tell, don't, tell them you don't think they should have any more to drink. Okay. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Andy joins us from Chicago. Hi, Andy. You're on the, you're on the air. Hi. Um, I have a couple of things I noticed. Uh, lots of people, lots of men wear hats in restaurants. And uh, when I was a kid growing up, I was told never to wear a hat inside. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if the, if the etiquette changed or what on that. Another thing is elbows on the table. See other people doing it also. And as a kid, I was growing up always here. My mom always said, to know which plate is yours, you should always ask yourself a question. Is there any bread left? And that's where you should go. The left hand plate is yours, not the right hand plate. Huh. Okay. Not sure. I'm not quite sure. I understand that last piece. So, uh, if you're sitting at the table, okay. there's going to be a lot of plates on the table for bread. Right. And you don't know. So, you know, you go to a party and you just grab the closest one. See, if you're right-handed, typically you would pick uh-huh. the right hand, put the put your start eating the bread from the right hand side of your table, the right, you know, the plate on your right. Uh huh. But my mom always said you should ask yourself, is there any bread left? Oh, is there any bread left? To tell you the left. left. I got you. The left I got side you. Of you. That's where your bread is. Okay, let's have our authors, Rosemarie Burns and Linda Reed, answer your first two questions. So, um, Linda, let's start with you about hats in the restaurant. Hats are off in the restaurant, and I think it, it all goes back to, you know, a lot of the younger people have been wearing their baseball caps and that sort of thing, and I just don't think that they've had instruction. I mean, I've sometimes here at the University of Oregon football games, they even forget to take their hats off when they're playing the national anthem. So I think a lot of it is they just don't know. But hats would be off during um, going inside the building. And then in terms of elbows on the table, mm-hmm. um, it's actually – correct I, I it's permissible to put your elbow on the table if you're between courses mm. uh if you're if you're dining then during the part you know so let's just say you're having your main course um european style your your wrists actually rest on the edge of the table certainly not your elbow 
And then American style dining, you're going to have one hand in your lap, and then you're right. You're going to be eating with your fork in your right hand. So there's no place for your elbow to be on the table during the process of eating. But again, you it is all right if you just. If you don't want to be leaning all over the table, but it is okay if, like, you're having a conversation and discussing something with someone at the table and you're waiting for the next course to come. At, at my house during, for example, during Christmas Eve or Christmas Day when I have my, my uh, dinners, I'll have a multi-course dinner. Mm-hmm. And because I'm serving it myself, and one of my guests might be helping me, but it's going to take longer than you might expect. So sometimes those guests are going to be there for maybe 10 minutes while we're, you know, pouring the soup and garnishing the soup and that sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, they're going to have some time span, span in between each course. So um, it's it's all right if they do that. Just don't lay all over the table. Okay. Thanks so much for the yeah. call, and Andy. We, just, we appreciate your, that. Your elbow is just barely placed on the table. It's not full-fledged not on full the table. Not full at, at the tip of the table, just slightly. Okay. Uh, let's You're see. not leaning your face into your arm or anything like that. Got you. Our phones are lit up. Let's go to Mark in Norfolk. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. Mark? Yes. Hello, Barbara. Hi. This is Mark. Uh, thank you very much for doing this show. Sure. Uh, my question uh, pertains to the uh, five-piece place setting that you buy at the store for your silverware. Um, what are some uses for the two spoons that you, um, for the, that you could use during a dinner? Okay. Um, Rosemary, you want to take that one? Sure. You have your coffee spoon, a teaspoon that you use for coffee or tea, and you have your place spoon, which is a larger spoon for soup, and that's generally for a minestrone or something like that. Sometimes they use that spoon for pasta along with your fork. Okay. And you can also place it at the top of your plate for dessert with a fork, and that we illustrate that in our book. Okay. Did that answer your question, Mark? Uh, yes, thank you okay, very much. Okay, thank you so much for the call. I appreciate that. Speaking of, uh, Mark was talking about um, spoons and so forth. If you are served iced tea and um, and you have the option to add sugar or add a sweetener and there's a long spoon, once you've stirred your tea, where do you put that spoon? Um, well, it depends on if they brought the iced tea glass with an underplate. So some of those okay. pedestal glasses, in theory, if they had a small plate that it rests on, then once you would stir it, you would put that at an angle on the back side of that little under plate. Okay. But if you've stirred the spoon, stirred the sweetener, and you have the long spoon inside your iced tea glass, then mm-hmm. you're, you raise up the glass and your thumb is on the front side of your glass, but your forefinger is going to press that long iced teaspoon to the back of the glass. And your other fingers are wrapped around the back side of the glass, so you're kind of gripping it. And so that forefinger holds the iced teaspoon away from your face, and then you sip from the front of the glass, and that iced teaspoon remains in the glass. Oh, so you leave it in the glass. Oh. You do. Unless there's a place setting. Okay. Very interesting. Felicia joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Felicia. Are you on the air? Hi, Barbara. Um, I had a question. I'm left-handed. And oftentimes the traditional place setting, it can be kind of awkward. You have to reach across your plate to get your drink. I was wondering if it's ever appropriate to flip the place setting for a left-hander. Okay. Uh, Rosemary, what do you think? No. <laughs> no, you just um, have to deal with it. One one thing to your advantage is that it would be nice if you learned how to use continental style. You use your fork. For eating, and your fork remains in your hand, so you don't have to switch it over. You know it how you eat American hand. style, you switch it back and forth? So you take your fork, and you you cut your meat, and you, you would take your fork and put it in your right hand, and then you'd pick it up and eat it. This way, because you're left-handed, and I eat this way, European style, continental style it's called, um, you keep your fork in your left hand so and your knife. So you cut your meat, and then you bring your left hand up to your mouth with your left fork. But you have, the rule is that you have to keep your knife in your hand at the same time. And we have instructions for that in our book. And that would help you immensely from going back and forth. Since you're left-handed, that would make it much easier for you. And it's a much easier and more refined way of eating anyway. Okay. Thank you so much, Felicia, for the call. You know, you bring up the difference between continental and American. What, is, what are the differences? 
Well, in continental style, you leave your fork in your left hand, and you leave, and you have your knife in your right hand, and you cut your meat one piece at a time, and you pierce it into another another piece of uh, food that's on your plate, and then you take your fork with the tines down, and you bring it up to your mouth, and you put it in your mouth, and and then you eat your food, and you put it back down, and you do the same thing, and you continue it. There's no switchback. With American style, you take your fork and knife, and you cut it. Then you have to take your knife and put it down and switch your fork from your left hand to your right hand to then convey it to your mouth. Or continental style, you're already there. You're set to go. You pick up your knife, you pick up your fork, you cut it, you put it in your mouth. There's a resting position and an I am finished position that you place on your plate. This is also in our book, which work do I use? Mm -hmm. So that's the difference is that you keep, you use your left hand for eating with your fork remains in your left hand and your right hand has the knife. And the only time you put them down is when you're rested, resting or you're completing your meal. Your meal, okay. Or That's... contrary to the zigzag for America, and you're, you know, you're picking up your fork, you're cutting it, you're putting down your knife, clanking it, making more noise, transferring your fork from your left hand to your right hand, then conveying the food to your mouth. <laughs> so it's much easier and more refined to eat continental style. Okay, Jonathan joins us from Hampton. Hi, Jonathan, you're on the air. Hey, great, great conversation. More Thank people you. need to be listening to this. Um, my wife and I, when when we uh, have dinners in our home, uh, we we don't use paper napkins. We don't use plasticware. Uh, everybody drinks from a glass, whether it's water, whether it's wine, whether it's beer, and we get called uppity all the time. But I love this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's a compliment. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you that, can come dine with us, and we won't call you up at Absolutely, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the? Oh, wait a minute. We have another call. Joanne joins us from the Eastern Shore. Hi, Joanne. You're on the air. Hi there. How are you? Okay. Um, uh, what an interesting conversation. Because just the other day, I was asked the question um, from a friend who thinks that I. And the local Miss Manners, which I'm not, but I I was raised with pretty good manners. But she asked, uh, is it all right to take a piece of bread just after someone has, or a roll, has asked you to pass the bread and or rolls? And uh, is it all right to take your roll first and then pass the bread? And I said I had no idea, but my my first inclination would be to say, do you mind if I take a roll and then pass the bread? But I said, uh, I, you stumped me on one, on this question. So, uh, so I would like to know what the answer is. If okay. Is- uh, let's, let's give them a chance to answer you then, uh, ladies. Okay. Um, if, your basket, if the bread basket is in front of you, then you would take the bread basket and you would hold it to the person to your left. You would offer them a piece of bread, not relinquishing the bread basket, but you would hold the bread basket, let them take a piece of bread to your left. Then you would take your piece of bread, and then you would pass that basket to the right. Ah, okay. So if you're you closest to the bread. You just don't want to let that basket go to the left, because you're always served to the right, continually. Everything goes to the right. Okay. Counterclockwise, so it goes to the right. So just because, as a mannerly, you would take your bread basket and you would just tilt it to the person next to you and say, would you like a piece of bread? They would take a piece of bread or say, no, thank you. Then you would take a piece of bread, and then you would continue it on to the right. To pass to the right. Thanks so much for the call, Joanne. We appreciate it. I'm trying to get all the calls in before we run out of time. Mary Ellis joins us from Franklin. Hi, Mary Ellis. How are you? Hey, how are y'all? Doing great. Um, This happened many years ago at just a regular family meal, but it does... um, illustrate the point of why you should never talk with your mouth full of food. Um, We were having quite a um, lavish meal that night. Um, One of the things that my mother had fixed, uh, they had just recently come out, were (laughs) SpaghettiOs. And um, I... We only have about two minutes, Mary Ellen. (laughs) I took a mouthful of SpaghettiOs, and then I turned to say something to my mother. Uh And unfortunately, at that same moment, 
I had a very unexpected sneeze. Uh oh. Oh, and Lord. I sneezed SpaghettiOs <laughs> all over my mother. Oh, no. <laughs> That's an excellent reason not to talk with your mouth full, Mary Ellis. <laughs> Ladies, you want to respond? <laughs> well, I would say be just be glad it was your mother and not an, a boss or an employer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. We appreciate the call, Mary Ellis. I tell you, we I cannot believe this hour has flown by. We have um, probably less than two minutes. So I want to ask you all, um, what do you think is the biggest um, thing that we do incorrectly in terms of etiquette that if we just change that one thing, it would make the world a better place? So let me start with you, Linda, first. Well, you know, I, I don't know about making the world a better place <laughs> in terms of an etiquette mistake, but I would say set the table, have dinner, invite a friend over. Okay. Fantastic. That is Linda Reed. She is a co-author of the book, Which Fork Do I Use? And Rosemarie, what do you think? Well, I would think self-respect, just respecting yourself and respecting others. And just getting together is the most important thing and making everyone feel good about themselves. If you make everyone feel good about themselves, they're going to like you. And I think we'd have a better world. Okay. And ladies, are you serving dinners or are you giving a dinner party during the holidays? Can you tell us oh, a little yeah, bit so about it? Lots of them. Lots of them. <laughs> Can you can you tell us it's about our time of year, boy? I know. Well, tell we, us... we can't get we can't get in trouble for having too lavish of a party at Christmas time. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell us very quickly um, about one of your theme. Is one will one be a themed party, or are they all just general holiday parties? I have I've a Christmas decorating party dinner party for about twenty years now. So we okay. I've done them in different formats, but it's all based around a Christmas carol. And I have a condensed version where you can read the whole story in thirty minutes. And we pass out scripts and we let people participate. And sometimes it's before dinner, sometimes it's after. If I do it during a tea, so it's I, there's five chapters, so I do a five course tea and. And uh, my house is all decorated in Dickens, so it's just great fun, and people love coming to Oh, it. it sounds like a lot of fun. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so very much, Rosemarie Burns and Linda Reed, authors of Which Fork Do I Use? And we will and be right Barbara. back. <laughs> Hi, this is Essie Patha Merkerson from Law & Order. You are listening to Another View at 89.5 WHRV. Oh, unfortunately, we cut Linda off, I believe, right at the last minute. So I'm going to see if our producer, Lisa Godley, can uh, tell me what she wanted to share. And I'll share that with you in just a moment. Next Wednesday, the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce will hold its 31st annual meeting, where they will honor their volunteer of the year. The keynote speaker will be the country's first elected African-American governor, L. Douglas Wilder. Lisa Godley recently spoke with the former governor about his years of service, the state of the country, and his goals for the future. In 1970, Lawrence Douglas Wilder became the first African American to serve in the Virginia Senate since Reconstruction, but this grandson of slaves was just beginning his political career. Fifteen years later, he made history again as Virginia's first African American lieutenant governor, and five years after that, the nation's first elected black governor. I, Lawrence Douglas Wilder, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. So when asked about the force that drove him to the political arena, he sums it up this way. The object of a public servant is to serve the public. I believed always in the words of Lincoln, government of the people, for the people, by the people. And in all of it, there's no reference at all to self. The former governor also had this to say about the current field of candidates battling it out for the country's highest elected office. Well, <laughs> I don't mean to put anybody down because people will say, hey, you were in that category yourself once. Many people say that if this is the cream of the crop, then God help the milk. And uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I can say that too many of the candidates who are running 
are speaking about what they are against. I'm against this, I'm against that, I'm against the other. What are you for? What are you preparing to do to improve where we are in this country today and how we go? Doug Wilder will be in Norfolk on December 9th to serve as keynote speaker for the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce's 31st annual meeting. He's expected to address the group on the current economic and political climate in Virginia. So I asked the former soldier his thoughts about sequestration and military downsizing. It's not the amount of money that we spend, but how we spend it, how we prioritize, how we make certain that we are not wasting money. Uh, I served in the military. I believe in defending our nation. But I know a lot of uh, the money that we spend under the guise of certain things isn't done properly. It was his love of serving people that caused L. Douglas Wilder to return to politics 10 years after leaving the governor's mansion. This time, it would be for a position that would put him even closer to the people, mayor of Richmond. It's far more difficult in my judgment to navigate that stream as the representative very close to the people because you are accessible to them or you should be. And that's another of the problems that happens. Too many people are not making themselves accessible. Wilder chose not to seek a second term, but hasn't slowed down. Now in his 80s, he continues to pursue his dream of building a national slavery museum and shared why he feels this project is so important. There is no adequate discussion of race in America, nor has there ever been. Whenever race comes up as a discussion, people will tell you, well, you know, we, we, we'll get to that a little, a little later. Or get past it, get over it. Americans have never really been taught what slavery was in this country, what it's about, the effects, and the lingering tensions that could result therefrom. So if we're fortunate, we want to have the U.S. National Slavery Museum located 14th and Broad Street, open, running, and operating in uh, 2019 for the 400-year celebration. He's also on the move promoting his new book, Son of Virginia, A Life in America's Political Arena. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And Governor Wilder will be at the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce, their 31st annual meeting next Wednesday. Uh, Linda Reed and uh, Linda Linda Reed and Rosemary Burns asked me to let you know you can get a copy of the book Which Fork Do I Use at whichforkdoiuse.com. And before we leave you this afternoon, let me tell you about an event happening tomorrow evening. The Beauty for Ashes Contemporary School of Dance presents Bagley's Christmas, the story of a Cajun Creole family Christmas tradition that takes an unexpected turn. It's a treat for the whole family, Saturday, December 5th at 7.30 p.m. at the Mary T. Christian Auditorium at Thomas Nelson Community College. Tickets are available. This is one of just many events we showcased on our website anotherviewradio.org just click on events for the latest happenings and don't forget to sign up for our eview newsletter a once a week reminder of upcoming shows next week is the another view roundtable the last one of 2015 and there are lots of hot topics for our pundits our theme music was composed and performed by jay Sennett. lisa godley is our show producer victor bowen is our audio engineer and kamaria mason and lillian johnson answered our phones i'm barbara ham lee Hey, guess what? I'll see you tomorrow night on our sister station, WHRO-TV, as we present Joe Bonamassa in concert. That's tomorrow night at 9. And, of course, we'll get together again next Friday at noon for another view.